what is called the uh, Revelation of the Old Testament, and that is, of course, the book of Daniel. In the balance, and found wanting. Daniel chapter number 5. I believe that there are plenty of examples where someone did not learn the lesson. There are certain things that God allows us to do, but there are certain things He does not. And Daniel chapter 5, we're going to break down uh, this as we go through it. But in verse number 5, it's where I will read, Suddenly, the finger of a human hand appeared and wrote on the plaster of the wall near the lampstand in the royal palace. The king watched the hand as it wrote. The king's countenance was changed and his thoughts troubled him so that the joints of his loins were loosed and his knees smote one against another. And the king cried aloud, bring in the astronomers, the Chaldeans, the soothsayers, and the king spake and said to the wise men of Babylon, Whosoever shall read this writing and show me the interpretation thereof shall be clothed with scarlet and have chains about his gold chains about chains of gold about his neck, and shall be the ruler the third shall be the third ruler in the kingdom. Father, again, we thank you for allowing us to gather. We thank you for the blessings of the day. We're so grateful that you've allowed us to open your word and look within its, the holy writ to glean from the truths of your word. Guide us in our study and forgive us where we fail. For Christ's sake, I pray. Amen. Not learning the lesson... Uh, who was it that said that doing the same thing and expecting a different outcome is the very definition of insanity? Well, that is about the truth of the matter, isn't it? So here, Belshazzar, his dad was Nebuchadnezzar, Verse number two. And he is having quite a party until he sees the handwriting on the wall. Go down to verse number 25 with me, please. Daniel chapter number 25. And this is the writing that was written. Many, many tekel you farsen, which is the interpretation of the thing. Many, God hath numbered thy kingdom and finished it. Tekel, thou art weighed in the balances and art found wanting. Farsus, Paris, Thy kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and Persians. But it was written in Aramaic. You remember the three languages of the Bible is Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. 
Now it's called Koine Greek, K-O-N-A. It's common man's Greek. The Lord did not want the, the most educated to be the ones to understand Scripture. He wanted the Scriptures for everybody. And on average, people had an eighth grade education. But what I want to share with you tonight is that Nebuchadnezzar, excuse me, Belshazzar was well aware of what happened to his dad, wasn't he? Let's go down to verse, uh, I'm kind of running a muck here. Uh, Daniel's reminder, let's go down to verse number 17 of this chapter. Let's back up to verse yeah, uh, verse number 17. Well, that's not... I, I'm having some difficulty. Just, just bear with me and keep me in your prayers. Uh, I want to take you down to verse 20. The tree that thou sawest, which grew and was strong, and height reached unto heaven, and the sight thereof of all the earth. Where are you? Where, are you? Where am I? Oh, no wonder. No wonder it didn't make sense to me. Okay. Let's try verse 17 this time in chapter 5. Why don't we do that? Then Daniel answered and said to the king, Let thy gifts be to thyself, and give thy reward to another. Yet I will read the writing unto the king, and make known to him the interpretation. O thou king, the most high God gave Nebuchadnezzar thy father a kingdom and majesty and glory and honor. And for the majesty that he gave him, all people, nations, and languages trembled and feared before him, whom he would, uh, would he slew, and whom he would kept alive, and whom he would he set up, and whom he would he put down. Notice verse 20. But when his heart was lifted up and his mind hardened in pride. He was deposed from his kingly throne and they took his glory from him and he was driven from the sons of men and his heart was made like uh, to like the beast and he dwelled there in the wild asses and fed him with grass and ox like oxen and his body was wet with the dew of heaven till he knew that the most high God ruleth in the kingdom of men and that he appointeth over whomsoever he will notice his heart was lifted up now let's go back to chapter 4. We will work this out. <laughs> chapter number 4. Starting with verse 28 of chapter number 4. All this came upon King Nebuchadnezzar. At the end of 12 months he walked into the palace, uh, the, uh, palace of the kingdom of Babylon. And the king spake and said, Is not this great Babylon that I have built from the house of the kingdom by my might, of, by the might of my power and for the honor of my majesty? Look what I have done. 
I am the, the ruler of all the known world. Okay? Now isn't that the charge that Daniel gave to Belshazzar his son? That he was lifted up with pride and he hardened his and his mind, you know, he, he, he got convinced himself that he is something else. I don't care how high a person gets in this world, he or she is still answerable to the Almighty. Amen. No one is above God. Now I realize that pride is an issue. I'm thankful I don't have that problem too much. But pride's an issue for all of us, isn't it? James said, God resisteth the proud and gives grace unto the humble. Right. Who was the individual that first was cited as being prideful? Was that not Lucifer? In Isaiah 14, when he said, I will arise, I will be like the Most High. Those five I wills of Satan of Lucifer actually I'm going to be sitting next to the Almighty I'm going to depose Christ isn't that funny and I'm going to be somebody and who knows he could have had his set side on the very throne itself couldn't he but I say to you that God cast him out he did not have enough strength to resist the power of the Almighty. Luke 15, he was thrown, I saw Satan fall from the sky, lightning from the sky fell to the earth. And his abode is abode of darkness. But pride has always been an issue. How many of you remember parents who told their children, take pride in your work. Okay? But you know, dear ones, there is a certain level of pride that we should have about ourselves. But when that pride seeps inside of us and we think that we're something else and we are getting ready for a hard fall. The Egyptians, they were a very proudful people. They survived a seven year famine, which was unheard of. They were rich, and selling that grain made them even richer. They had an army. People could not stand against them. I mean, they were something else. But they were certainly no match for the Almighty, were they? When Moses stood before him and said, let my people go, he should have said, take them and go. <laughs> but oh no. You know, they're my people. They're my slaves. And you can't have them. So he began his vindictive work of trying to bring them down. And Egypt suffered terribly because of his arrogance and his pride. I have seen young preachers that had an air about them that they thought they were something else. But you know God is a wonderful teacher. Okay? God is a wonderful teacher because the Lord himself can teach us some very valuable lessons of what it means to be in servitude to him. At the pastor's fellowship we were talking about the shortage of preachers nowadays and men are retiring. I don't what is that? <laughs> Men are retiring. 
I don't, I, don't, I don't know what that is. There was one point where I started, my, my mind started going to the idea that I'm going to retire one day. Now I like to do it while I'm able to stand on my own two feet. You know? But you know the Lord is a good teacher. Because I don't find in Scripture that there's a retirement plan for pastors. That's right. I see, a, I see that we are here to serve as long as we're able to serve. And you know that's okay. I remember past, a young preachers talking about, well I'm going to be here for five or six, maybe five years, then I'll move on to some other church, and I'll work my way up the ladder to... He's not serving the same God I am. <laughs> we don't get a choice of where we serve. We're told where we serve. And let me, can I qualify that just a little bit? You know what? When the Lord says, I want you here in that still small voice, you know, sometimes I think He ought to yell at us once in a while. We'd feel better. But that still small voice, this is where I want you. And the very minute, if I say no, trouble. Life is going to get bad. You see, I have learned that lesson. I've got the scars to prove it. That if we don't do what he asks, we're asking for trouble. Now I said all of that for this purpose. It is God that handles our lives. It is God that's over this nation. He setteth up kings. Wasn't that Nebuchadnezzar's conclusion? He setteth up kings. He destroys and he does whatsoever he wills in the kingdom of men. And praise God for that. The world, these people think that they have complete control of all that's happening around them. I say to you that if it wasn't for the permissive will of the Almighty, they'd have nothing. But Belshazzar, he knew what happened to dad. He wasn't cut off from his father. He knew that his father regained his senses and lifted his head and said that the, the Lord God Almighty and who he is and praised him for. Folks, Nebuchadnezzar saw all this. And now we see in chapter 5 that he's following the same path that his dad did in his pride and in his arrogance. So what's the result? Dear ones, he is going to fall. And he's going to fall hard. In fact, at the end of this chapter, he loses his life, doesn't he? Okay? So we need to be careful. Okay? We need to be careful. But the Lord is such a good teacher that He can show us how we ought to be. We just have to be willing to follow it, don't we? And my word. He said He couldn't read the writing? Isn't that interesting? An educated man like Belshazzar and he couldn't read the writing on the wall? I think that was on purpose. I'm so thankful that God can hear a prayer no matter the language they use. He understands it. Okay? Who was that? Uh, wasn't that the Elliots that made contact with these people and they got out of the plane and the people speared them and killed them? And one of them's wife ends up going back to the bush country and staying with them for 30 years and leading them to Christ, establishing a mission, a mission work and, and, and helping those people. It's amazing, isn't it? But we serve an awesome God, folks. We really, really do. But Daniel said, your time is about over. 
your time is about over. So, Nebuchadnezzar, or excuse me, Belshazzar, this is what's going to happen. Bring the robe, bring the jewelry, make him a leader of the third of the kingdom. That would be a good size place, a good size real estate, wouldn't it? And Daniel says, I don't want none of it. I don't need none of it. Now, as you know, the prophets of the Lord never were much on making a lot of money, we would say. But they certainly delivered the word of God as God instructed. And a lot of times they were told to tell the king things that he probably would not have liked to have heard. But it still was the truth. And whatever they said came to pass. Do you remember the instruction in Deuteronomy? He said if the prophet prophesies and it does not come to pass, you need to stone him. Get rid of him. Because he's not speaking in the name of the Lord. Making promises that he has no authority to make. Now I'm not up for stoning, but I can tell you this. Men who are teaching false doctrine will one day answer before the Almighty if they're saved. Okay. James chapter 3, Be not many masters, verse 1, for they shall receive the greater condemnation. We're going to be judged, whether Sunday school teacher, pastor, anyone who teaches the Word of God, we are held to a standard that one day we will answer. So Daniel told him the truth. Why is it it seems like it takes us so long to learn the lessons from our forefathers? Why is it it takes so long? Well, I know that when we reach a, about 18, 19, 20 years old, we suddenly are smarter than our parents. And we know more and we are up to date on the current things. You know? What about Facebook? What is Facebook? Some would say. Like that's a bad thing. And then you say, well I remember the days when we did not have internet at all. I grew up on a party line on the phone. Okay? Okay? Oh my word! How did you live like that? We didn't know any difference. I don't think a lot of this modern technology has made things better. It just made temptation more accessible. Okay? But pride and hardness of heart Turn to Hebrews chapter number 3, please. Hebrews chapter number 3. And I start with verse number 7. Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost saith, Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation, in the day of temptation in the wilderness, when your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works forty years. Wherefore, I was grieved with that generation, and said, They do err, always err in their heart, and they have not known my ways, so I swear in my wrath they shall not enter into my rest. Isn't that exactly what happened to them when they got to the promised land and they decided to send spies into the, the land, check things out, and the first land they come to is Gath, 
So no wonder they said we look like grasshoppers in front of them. And they went around and came back and ten of them said it's out of reach. There's no way we can do it. And only two that said we can't. Those two entered the promised land, didn't they? Joshua and Caleb. Okay? The rest of that generation died. But they provoked him, didn't they? And he was grieved with that generation. And he told them, and he grew angry with them. And then all of a sudden they changed their mind. All right, Lord, if it means that much to you, we'll go and go in. No, you will not. You will go south. And you will die in the desert. But what was it? They hardened their heart. In the Hebrew writing, he's telling those Hebrew people, do not do like they did. Do not harden your heart. As when they did so in the desert. And they perished in the desert. It's a dangerous thing to disobey and move against the Almighty. Well, you know, pride is a terrible, terrible thing for all of us. But then to add to that, Hardness of heart. My word. If that's not a recipe for disaster, I don't know what is. Some time ago, I remember visiting over here. And this lady told me, she said, Well, I'm not sure if I want to confuse my children with religion. Okay. She had a different path. And I guarantee you, it was not a good path. Lives have been wrecked because they thought they could do it themselves rather than depending on the guidance of the Almighty. We're not designed to handle our own life. We need His power. We need His direction. And when we follow His direction, do we not receive peace? Take uh, verse number 12. Take heed, brethren... Lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief departing from the living God. You better be careful. Okay? Now this is not really rocket science. This is Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 12 is what I just read. This is not really rocket science. A child of God who deliberately disobeys what God wants him to do is facing trouble. It's pure, plain, and simple. Okay? Hebrews chapter 12 defines it as chastisement, doesn't it? Chastisement. As the man came to me one day at church a long time ago, those poor folk with my first church I pastored, those poor blessed, blessed heart folk, bless their pea-picking hearts, he came to me and he said, I've had a, I said, how's your week? I've had a terrible week. You had a terrible week? Why? He said, I made the mistake of praying for patience. Well, you know, uh, in his case, he did answer his prayer, didn't he? Yeah. Right? The rest of us, we're afraid to pray for patience because, you know, our lives, is, we feel like our lives are hard enough as it is. But the point is when the Lord leads in your life, sometimes it's not going to be the easiest path. Okay? Not the easiest path. My teachers, my one of my professors, I had him more than any others. And he said, now you wonder why I'm hard on you. He said, you think school is hard. Wait till you start pastoring a church. Then you'll know what hard is. That's a whole new level. Well, he was right, of course. He was right. And you know, pride is always a danger. Pride is always a danger. Well, we see... 
Daniel told him this is what's going to happen. This is how it's going to happen. And of course, Nebuchadnezzar, uh, uh, Belshazzar, excuse me, Belshazzar, he sure did. He was killed that night, wasn't he? And the kingdom was taken from him. And Darius, the Medes and the Persians came into being. And Daniel still remained in his position of high rank in Darius's, uh, under Darius's leadership. Because they had the pyramid system of government. Districts, leaders and districts and so forth. <laughs> I get tickled. Um, I'm going to, let me pause for a second here. I get tickled. They're used, how many of you remember Veggie Tales? Anybody remember Veggie Tales? Yeah. Well, they had one about Darius. And I went, Ugh! <laughs> It's Darius is the correct pronunciation. Darius. His position was vicarious. <laughs> All right. Do you know why they used vegetables? Because they didn't think moms would let their kids watch for candy. So they went with vegetables. And they were pretty good too, weren't they? You know, I still like them. So just so, uh, Carl, just so you know, when I get stressed, I get out a Bugs Bunny... Uh, DVD and I sit and I watch and I can watch them things a hundred times and they're still funny. Now if it's really serious I'll just turn on some Three Stooges and I get the room to myself. And it's still funny. You know? <laughs> but Belshazzar, his kingdom came to a swift end and Babylon was gone. And you know the Medes and the Persians were a vicious, vicious group. When they conquered, they took slaves, they killed and maimed and destroyed. And that was part of the, you know, and they took the spoils of war back. But even the Medes and the Persians would one day fall. You remember that statue that Nebuchadnezzar dreamed about? The head of gold being Babylon, of course. And then next was the Medes and the Persians. And after them came the Greeks. But you know, every empire of man has always fallen. There's without question, without exemption, every empire of man has fallen. Now what makes the United States different? It was founded upon biblical principles. That's how it was founded. And the opportunity for our leaders to do what is right has been there. And then they fuss about the, the separation of church and state. Well, that wasn't even together. That's completely separate. Two events that are completely separated. And we don't want church in government. Well, we should have church in government. <laughs> Somebody with a working brain needs to be up there. One year, one of the congressmen decided that, you know, we should have a word of prayer when we begin our sessions. He said, and I know the man to do it. And they brought in a pastor that would be with them for the next 20 years and every morning, the opening session, they would have a word of prayer. I'm not sure they do that now. But if pride and the hardness of heart takes hold, then our next generation will never learn better. Okay? We can't use the excuse don't do as I do, do as I say. That just never has worked. I don't know about you. But I tell you, when God sets up a kingdom, it will last. And before I leave this, I remind you that one day the Lord Jesus Christ will return and He will establish His kingdom just as He promised. And nobody's going to threaten His kingdom. Okay? Nobody. And when whoever steps into his presence, they will bow and they will give their fealty to him. 
who ruleth over all. And there'll be no lawyers. Praise God. Can we do that? Praise God. There'll be no lawyers. We won't need for lawyers. He'll look into their hearts and know what's going on and render out judgment. And we won't have to be concerned about the world in its condition nowadays. So let's not repeat this, okay? Let's not repeat the past. Our, none of us had perfect parents. My dad was the hardest working man that I could, that I, that anyone, uh, anybody that I've heard of. He worked very hard for very, very many years and not much pay at it. But that was his way of living and that's how he provided for his family from dawn till dusk. Now he never worked on Sunday. Okay? Never worked on Sunday, but he did work six days a week. And, you know, he, uh, <laughs> he could make Lincoln squeal for mercy. Oh. You know? But, I never went without food. I had clothes. I had a place to sleep. And rightly so, can we not sing that song? I have a roof up above me. Shoes on my feet. Thank you, Lord, for your blessings on me. Let's be careful that we don't find ourselves in the balances and found wanting. Because we cannot repeat the past. I appreciate you being here tonight. Let's stand together, please. <laughs>